Hi, I'm Steve Harley, and you're listening to me on Cattails. You're listening to Cattails. Hi, I'm Cat, and you're listening to Cattails. Steve Harley has spent over 50 years making us smile. The rebel with the cause really has done it all, achieving number one chart success, selling millions of records worldwide, and writing music that will live on forever. One of the nicest men in the business takes time out to chat with me about music and life. Steve explains how he has achieved the purest sound possible on his latest album Uncovered, why he wrote a third verse on Compared With You and Who It's For, what advice he has for young people getting into the music business today, how he gets irritated by the woke society and about his love of birds of the feathered variety. This is the one with Steve Harley. First of all, Steve, I'm going to just say thank you so much for coming on the show because I know that my audience will be thrilled to hear all about you. So thank you. That's the first well, thing. That's okay. It's my pleasure. Oh, that's good. Well, let me... I hope I hope it will be. <laughs> <laughs> it will be. I'll be gentle with you. Don't worry. <laughs> well, do you know, I just want to um, to start the conversation for May, Steve, just by asking what you're doing now. You mentioned there that you were in your your office there in the woods, and that's got me all excited because I love the woods. I really do, and I think they're just such a spiritual and relaxing place to be. So, are you surrounded by trees at the moment? Yeah. Um... Yeah, yeah, we're, we're 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 very fortunate. We're on the the Essex Suffolk border, just a couple of miles from the the River Stour, which is you know Constable Country River. Um, and yeah, I've got a couple of acres of woodland with, with overgrown ancient orchard uh, and woodland with uh, quite a lot of yeah various not, trees, and uh, I love it. Absolutely love it. I walk around it a lot. Uh, one of my great interests is bird life. Yeah. I'm fascinated by birds, and uh, we get everything here. And even in our garden, which is bordering the woods, get a every English garden bird that you could look up. We get it's it's fabulous. Um, it costs a couple of grand a year to feed them. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of bird food gets uh, sent out there, but it's uh, it's a wonderful thing to see. I mean, I I, I can walk into the kitchen first thing in the morning and look out into the garden oh, and lovely. you know i'll see this morning i saw a pair of moorhens muntjac deer great spotted woodpecker on the bird nuts um long-tailed tits great tits blue tits robins blackbirds they're all here and uh i'm fascinated by it i'm fortunate because there's so many of those it's are in good, decline yeah. aren't they now i mean you just watch any of the wildlife yeah. programs and it's it's heartbreaking because there's so much built up area now there's less and less places for them to go isn't there yeah yeah and there's disease um we haven't seen a green finch for five or six years oh. uh, they get diseased uh, chaffinches do too but we we had a chaffinch a couple of chaffinches a few weeks ago and dunnocks um wrens yeah, some of them are, I've got a problem. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bloody shame. Yeah, real shame. It is. Well, look, I live up in North Norfolk, and uh, up here at the moment, the one that the one bird that's been creating all the fuss for everybody is this white-tailed eagle. Yeah, that's right. It's yeah, um, amazing. I haven't seen it yet myself, but I just I can't wait really. Yeah, I've read about that. That's fascinating. Um, very rare. Um, it is, and they were going to bring. I think they were going to introduce them again, but this particular one, I think, came from Wales. I could be making this up now, Steve. To be he's probably lost. Yeah. <laughs> he was probably lost. Thought, oh, this is a nice place to stay. <laughs> yeah, I watched. Um, we were out at dinner, Mrs. Harley and I, uh, just last night, and on the way back, back, um, I saw a sh- shady, sh- shadowy figure in a in a, in a um, rowan tree. And that was a um, sparrowhawk, and he uh, thrust himself down all of all of a sudden. He must have seen a, a vole or something wandering about. Yeah, and they're straight on it. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, we get red kites are quite familiar around here. Mm, yeah, 
in this place. But North Norfolk's fabulous. We we go up there. I mean, I go up and stay in Holt and uh, Burnham, oh, Burnham that's Market. That's just all around the area that I am, actually. I'm just outside of Holt, yeah. actually. It's, it's a lovely place, isn't it? It's... It's really, really good, yeah. Except they, they started charging to park by the beach in most of those lovely places, which infuriates me. Well, that's because there's so many people now visiting, I think, to be honest. It's to, to keep them all away. <laughs> um, yeah, it's more than that. It's, it's they know that you'll pay, and the, the motorist is just a cash cow. Oh, absolutely. And you've got to, you've got to put your car turn. somewhere, haven't you? And then, you know, that's it. It's always someone after your money somewhere, isn't there? <laughs> oh. But, you know, looking out of the, the woods there, and you described an, un, an absolutely beautiful environment there, um, I'm going to ask the obvious question, really. That must surely help your creativity with writing. Is that where you go to do your writing? I mean, is, is that the place where you gravitate to, or how does that all come about? Well, no. I, 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 I get inspired um, to a degree, but by the time I get back to the house, uh, after I've been out for an hour or two in the woods and whatever um no i i write at night uh i stay up until one maybe two a.m three or four times a week i suppose and that's where it all happens um in the dead of night in my study i don't have a studio at home just just some good software Mm -hmm. on an iphone and a nice echoey room and it can sound almost you know studio quality that's where I, yeah, but the ideas are there all the time. I mean, I, I, I told someone recently that I, I'm never, never, never without a notebook and pen, you know, even in this modern world, even with an iPhone in my pocket. Mm. I, I still, um, you know, I trained as a reporter when I was young and yeah. I'm, I'm a notebook and pen man, you know, longhand. It doesn't leave you, does it? It doesn't leave you. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny. It's funny. These old habits, aren't they, really? And you, you think the way that you, you've, you've sort of like ingrained yourself into these certain habits and, and you, you're then, you're wired, you're, ma- you're mentally wired in that way, aren't you, to yeah. create or to write or whatever? Yeah, I'm pretty flexible. I um, go with the flow to a degree and I like the modern world. I like young people. I like modern music um, to, up to a point. Um, funny thing is, though, when you hear, my wife plays radio radio two all day long in the house i like silence i I don't really listen to music i drive for four hours in complete silence you know yeah um i like that i like silence peace Mm. yeah but she she plays the radio i don't mind that and uh it's only when they they play a a massive hit from the 60s or 70s that my my ears prick up and think cracky that's a good record yeah that's a good song that's brilliantly played you know it's it's hard to say that about modern releases. I can't say that about an Ed Sheeran record, um, you know, Suffolk Boy himself. Um, I can't say that about Ed's music. It's it's kind of disposable. Mm. You don't feel like you're going to be listening to it in 30 or 40 years' time, whereas, you, you know, with 60s and 70s classics, you are. I, I, can't, I can't explain why, and I'm not grumpy about it, I'm, and I'm not criticising. Mm. It's just an observation yeah, that they mean. don't... They... I know what you mean. It's... I... Is it because they're familiar, though? You know, perhaps the generation, you know, growing up with Ed Sheeran will probably look back and, you know, let's say fast forward 30 years and look back and think, oh, they don't write them like that anymore. I can't see, yeah, you can't see the future. There's no way uh, you can know this. But uh, you, you don't often hear a new release, a new release by a young, new act, artist, that you think, well, that that's a classic in the making, you know, you don't often. I mean, like, I'm trying to think of one, racking my brains mm. now. All these, there are all these guys called James, aren't there? <laughs> <Yes>. uh, I, <laughs> there's, there's several blokes called James <laughs> uh, or um, Rag and Bone Man. Um, Perhaps that's the criteria. He's good. He's good. Yes, he is actually. Yeah, yeah, great, great singer. I'm not sure about the the, the songs though. You know, yeah. I, they got longevity. I, 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 there you go. I better, better get off this subject. I'm going to start sounding grumpy. <laughs> No, not at all. I think it, it begs the question, what makes a good song, though? I mean, is it something that you instantly know once you've written it? Or is it something that takes time to grow and, you know, get a life of its own? Yeah, I don't know. What's the formula? Um, well, I think a songwriter knows when they've got something worthwhile. Hmm. Um yeah, you can't. I mean, when we recorded "Make Me Smile," in, it was in November '74, 
it was recorded at Abbey Road for Best Years of Our Lives album. And I knew about Make Me Smile. I knew there was something different about it, something very worthwhile, um, certainly. And when we made the record with all the hooks in it, the backing vocals and the guitar solo and everything, we, we were in Abbey Road at about 10 p.m. Um, the managing director of EMI, my record company, came in to see us, uh, and he was a bit of a pal of ours, of mine, and um, mm-hmm. he said, have you got anything you can play me? And we, 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 Alan Parsons, who was my engineer, co-producer, we said, well, we're working on this that we kind of fancy a bit. And it was made me smile, and we played him a rough mix of it, and he just said, number one. Oh, wow. <laughs> And in those days, you know, a big record company, they could move mountains. They, if oh, they wanted it to go yeah. to number one, you know, they, they could get it in the top five without any trouble. Yeah. If if they really threw everything at, at it, if they promoted it to, 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 to the, 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 the greatest extent that they possibly could, mm. it's different today. But they, they could do that. And that was quite a thrill. I mean, he, he, true to his word, it went to number one. <laughs> but, wow. but, yeah, we, we, we kind of knew that there was something about that. Um, yeah, I've tended to know. It's a skill. It must be a skill that, like, like you just described there, you listened to that and you went, wow, that's the potential for a number one. It's worth us investing in it. We're going to put something behind it because we know it has that magic. You, that's a skill in its own right, isn't it? Well, it's uh, a marketing thing. I'm not a marketing man at all. But, um, yeah, it's a nice feeling when you come up with something that you, you think has the potential of, of longevity mm. being a big hit. I don't, I don't, can't, I can't think like that anymore. It, it's not the, what my, in my mindset, it's, I write for me, mm. uh, like my new album uncovered. There's only two of my songs on it. It's the first time I've made a, what's basically a, an album of other people's songs. Mm. Uh, I won't call them covers. They're interpretations because they're so different to the originals, the way I've produced it. Um, so I'm proud to say I'm quite quite precious about this. They're interpretations. Mm, that's a lovely <laughs> way of describing it because they are very very different from the original. Yeah, the super well they are. Yeah, ones. and there's only one, that's the only way I would do it. You know, even mm. way back when I did "Here Comes the Sun," it's nothing like a cover of the Beatles. It's uh, it's my own interpretation. And uh, the, the best covers of my own songs that I've heard are true interpretations rather than the strict, the straight covers, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really interesting looking at, at your new album here. I mean, it's oh, it's been out a, a, a few months, hasn't it? So it's had a little bit of time to sort of settle down for people to listen to. And it's interesting to see what people are coming up with. I've read a bit of the reviews on it, which are all outstanding, I have to say. And listening to the album, it's it's absolutely beautiful. That's the only way I can describe it. You know, you're, <laughs> you're taken somewhere else with this, Steve. It's just incredible. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sound, it's uh, you know? yeah. When I went in to 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 start it at Rockfield, a residential studio in South Wales, and we we turned up there, and my engineer, a great engineer called Matt Butler, Matt turned to me and he said, "Look, it's an acoustic album, all strings, right? There's no piano, no keyboards. It's all guitars, violin, viola, and a string, a string quartet section." Mm. And he said, how do you want it to sound? And I said, it's got to sound like I'm in the living room with you. Yeah. It mustn't sound like any, any, there's no EQ on this album, no, no effects of any sort whatsoever. And he said, so you don't want me to engineer? I said, that's about, <laughs> that's about it, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> just, <finished> just, pleased. <laughs> yeah. Just mic up these beautiful, great instruments that we all turn up with. Uh, mic up these beautiful instruments with the best microphones money can buy. We've got the best recording equipment money can buy. I had the best musicians money can buy, to be honest. Uh, Martin mm-hmm. Simpson, Barry Wickens, oh. you know, Ollie Hayhurst. Just great, great players way out there. And uh, so, yeah, it's an extremely pure, organic recording. And I'm proud of that. It, it, someone said, I, I said to someone I wanted it to sound like I was in your living room. And, he, and the guy interviewed me and he said, it's as though I'm in the studio with you. <laughs> yeah. I was really moved by that. I thought, what a great thing to say. <laughs> At 
been living the life of a sad lost soul With a head full of guilt and pain Like a messenger carrying bad news home I was torn between the loss and the gain Sometimes I thought survival, oh, oh Was only a hopeless compromise Many times I felt like quitting Then I saw you Dancing like a fire Only you As bright as any sun And me I was looking for something for so long then Only you came to me I've been traveling lonely from town to town On a road to find eternal youth I've been hiding my eyes from a life going wrong I was afraid to have to deal with the truth No message in the Bible, no, no No flash of lightning in the sky No compromise or pity Only you Dancing like a fire Only you As bright as any sun And me I was looking for something for so long Only you came to me Yeah, 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 yeah I've been falling apart since who knows when I didn't know who to thank or blame All the comforting messages ten by ten They said the bottle would bring eternal shame No symbols in the Bible, no, no No bolts of thunder in the sky No sentimental pity Only you Dancing like a fire Only you As bright as any sun And me I was looking for something for so long then Only you came to me Yeah, 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 yeah Hi, I'm Steve Harley, and you're listening to me on Cattails. And describe it for me when I when I listened it to the I've listened to it, you know the whole track whole track track after back up to back you know the whole 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 album and it it really did I closed my eyes and it really felt like you were in the same room yeah and you just don't get that same experience do you these days it is that because you've stripped it right back do you think with this you know not having the production or oh yeah oh, yeah 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 that, that helps doesn't that, it yeah that's it as I said um you turn up with top top line players plus they come in with fabulous handmade top of top of the line guitars and stuff you know we've all got really really great equipment and you know the best and and as i said they're they're virtuoso players so why mess 
why muck about? I don't, I don't, you know, I've got Martin Simpson on guitar. You know, yeah, it's like, let, let Martin loose. He, he would say to me, how do you see this going? Um, and I'd say, Martin, you know, you can do anything you want, mate. Just let me hear what you comes to you first. And what a thrill to see these people in, invent and create on the mm. hoof. Mm. It's, a, it's a lovely yeah. way to record. And, you know, you, you, I'd never really worked in a... I did a few nights, but never a long stint of a couple of weeks in a residential studio before. And it's just unusual for me to be with the, the people I'm employing, as it were, you know, the band, um, cooking bacon and eggs every morning <laughs> <laughs> and share, having dinner together. It was it was an experience yeah. and, uh, and uh, a good mindset. You know, it gave me a good feeling. And I think that shows in the singing and the recording as well, you know, all that. Yeah. The good vibes in the place, if you don't mind that sort of an antique expression. No, exactly. I, do you know, I was about to say that there was, there's a little bit of magic somewhere more than just, you know, stripping back the production side of it. There's that combination of, I don't know, there's there's the chemistry between you or there's there's certainly so much, so much feeling in yeah. every single song. You know, these are not spring chickens, these guys. And what you find is when you have been in the industry playing as a musician and earning a good livelihood and everything else, so you've done well, uh, you've survived, you've had this great longevity in a, in a career like all these guys have, you find every time without a, a, a exception uh, that they are good people, mm -hmm. really nice guys. The prima donnas, the moody ones, the ones who bring baggage everywhere they go, they get dropped by the wayside. Mm. They're going to struggle with their career, struggle to pay the bills, because people won't call them. Mm. People don't want to work with moody people, miserable people, yeah. bad-tempered people, rude people. You don't want them around you. I've had one or two in maybe the last 10 years, a couple on the road and you know you get a vibe a feeling that this chap is not being polite to the staff of the theater we're playing in the, the venue mm. and uh, you know once you get that and i'm very sensitive to it i've got antennae that's that, that, that walk in a room i can walk in a room and get pick up the vibes you know yeah. and if you if i find that then he's gone you know He's out. Yeah. He doesn't get asked back. Let's put it that way. Absolutely. Because we don't want that. When, when you leave a venue, you know, and I play two and a quarter hours, and everyone's going home with a good buzz, and that's all great. But when you when you leave a venue, and one of your crew has been less than polite, or got you know been out of order with with the venue, and um, just if mm. it has happened once or twice, mm. just if. Well, when you when we leave, they don't say that uh, Joe Schmo was a, a, a nasty piece of work. They say Steve Harley's roadies were. Yes. Steve Harley's crew. It's it, my name. It is. Yeah, yeah. So you don't carry those people with you. They don't, you don't want them on the tour bus. You don't want them in the dressing room. You don't want them backstage. So, so that, with musicians, it's the same. You don't get many of them, many that are, uh, just because they're creative people and, and they want to just please and play and please other people with their, with their talent. They're going to generally be decent people. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. When you've been at it all your career since you left school or college or whatever, mm. and you're in your sixties, you know, you, they're, they're good people. Yeah. So these guys at breakfast were so charming and <laughs> easygoing, good vibes and generous. And I just, it was just a very good feeling. And it shows on the record. Oh, you know? it certainly does. But how did you actually decide what you were going to put on that record? Because as you quite rightly say, there's only two of your tracks on there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And nine, and nine that are not mine. Exactly. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it wasn't difficult because... Um, I play a lot of guitar at home, um, just fiddling, mm. keeping the fingers, you know, the skin hard on the, on the tips of my left hand and stuff. You have to keep keep in trim. Yeah, um, sure. yeah uh, so I play a lot and you don't play your own songs all the time and you don't try and write songs all the time. So I play other people's songs. I sing, you know, I play Beatles songs and Buddy Holly, stuff like that. I don't know. And, um, 
those songs on the album are songs that I've been playing forever, except one or two are quite modern, like uh, Lost Myself, the Long Pigs track is from the from the ni- mid 90s. But I've been playing them at home on the piano or the guitar for years, uh, just warming up and having fun, you know, or playing them to my grandchildren, get them, get them dancing. Mm. And uh, it, it, so, yeah, it could have been any any eight or nine or ten tracks out of about 60. Um, but oh, they're just beautiful songs. The, the, the criterion that we use, Cat, is quite simply, do I wish I'd written that? Mm. You know, if you're a songwriter, I've I've got what, 100, about 140 songs published, I suppose, 10 or 11 albums. Um, when you do it yourself, and you you're going to say, do I wish I'd written that? It, it, does it really thrill me enough to think, crikey, I wish that was mine? Yes. And all nine of these songs are definitely in that category. I mean, absolutely, definitely. Even the, the simplest, the base, most basic of all of them would be the McCartney song, I've Just Seen a Face. Yes. And people think that's straightforward, but McCartney writes a brilliant narrative. You know, go back to Lady Madonna and paperback writer. McCartney writes narrative, and I do too. Not many songwriters do. It's a bit of a trick. Um, and it's, it's he says the serendipity in there is it's just so so it's so literary. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. He says, I, I, "Had it been another day, I might have looked the other way, mm. and I and I'd have never been aware. But as it is, I'll dream of her tonight." Yes. You know, had it been another day, it, it, it's serendipity. He didn't look the, look a, another way. He looked at her, and it stirred him. That was Jane mm. Asher, mm. and uh, so it's a clever song. It's not as not as basic or as simple as it might seem at first listen. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And the, <laughs> yeah. the lyrics are are the, the second component, aren't they? I always listen to lyrics, Steve. I really do because I just I just love to get in the, embroiled in the emotion of it all. And of course, being working with words, it's it's an important element of of where I am really. And one of the things that did strike me on the album there with your own track compared with you, um, now you've added some uh, added another verse in there, haven't you? I thought, hold on a second, I'm so familiar with this yeah. track. Hold on, <laughs> wait a second, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, I, what was happening there? <laughs> well, in 1976, when um, "Love's a Prima Donna" the album was released. I was prolific, you know, I was writing an album almost one a year, uh, releasing an album every every year, every two years. Um, as a young man, you're quite prolific, you know, it's not unusual. But I don't know what happened with Compared With You. I, I wrote two verses and then a, a little bridge and then sang the first verse again as a third verse. Hmm which is a bit of a cop-out. I don't know what happened. Why, to the age of 25, um, why did I not write a third verse? Why was I that lazy? Was I lazy? <laughs> did I run out of ideas? It's mad. I, that's, that's crazy to think that. <laughs> and I went down to Rockfield to make this album in the summer, uh, two years ago, a year and a half ago. And Matt, Butler, the engineer, who I've known forever, is a friend of mine, and uh, he said, why don't you re-record Compared With You, Steve? I said, why would I do that? He said, because it deserves a third verse. And I said, really? You think so? And I said, yeah, I can do that. And it, <clears throat> we went, uh, days went by, this day, that, and we, we, we didn't record the song until I'd written the third verse. And it went on and on. And he keeps kept saying to me, "Have you written that verse yet? Have you written that verse yet?" You know, every morning, and have you written that? <laughs> no, Matt. It will come when it comes. I, I'm 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 waiting for the muse to come and sit on my shoulder. It's got to be right, it, not just throw away. I'm not like that. You know, he knows that. And one morning, um, the very end of June. My dad was being cremated in Bury St. Edmunds, 200 miles away from where I was working. Mm. And he wanted a quick nobody there. It was, you know, did a Bowie. Mm. He was gone in no time. Once yeah. he, you know, once we'd done the funeral arrangements, it was a private with nobody there ceremony. Yeah. And it was 8.30 in the morning. And I sat outside the studio in the, in the Welsh uh, cornfields there and 
I was looking at some horses in a, in a meadow and and I was just sitting there thinking 8.30 in the morning in the sun and my dad was passing through being cremated and I sat and thought about my dad and uh, well 20 minutes later I walked back in they were cooking breakfast the guys it was about 9 o'clock because we, we'd start work at 10 and I just said to Matt I've got that verse now oh. <laughs> yeah 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 oh. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know now whether I was writing about my dad or my wife, mm. who has been loyal for 40 odd years to me and fabulous to me. Um, or I was also thinking, as my dad went passed away, um, I was thinking also about ancient, early relationships, because of my dad, you know, I'm growing up, yeah. thinking about growing up, thinking about my childhood, thinking about my young manhood because of my dad in my mind and what we'd been through and stuff. And I was thinking about some other girlfriends and uh, relationships. So you never know what's inspiring the words, but this the narrator is clearly, clearly uh, in a romantic mood and um, – reflective because yeah. he says you know I, I know we've reached a stage but he doesn't say what stage you're at yes. <laughs> I, I like to leave things to the imagination to you know yeah absolutely uh, you know I know we've reached a stage what is he talking about where's the what stage but and then he says to her but your eyes don't seem to age yeah and this is true you know you if you look you know it's in the eyes yes uh, yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah, I, there you go. I don't know where I'm leading with this cat. I'm rambling away here. But, um... No, you're not. Because but, cause I was actually going to ask you about who that song was about, because I absolutely adore that song. And then noticing, of course, that you'd put this third verse in there. And I love that line that you've just recited there about your eyes don't seem to age and how how beautifully that coined sort of um, longevity of love whoever that's for and it's lovely to hear that you're bringing your, you know, your father into that as well and it's, oh, it's just so beautiful I've been trying to write this line But the years have gone by in no time And you know it's not easy For a boy in love But I had to find the clue It could only come from you Like a waterfall You tingled me with your love And you know That since you loved me I have everything Hey, you know That since you loved me It's been easy All the things that I've been through Don't mean a thing compared with you You can give me life forever In a moment you Carry me like a child You're a goddess when I'm wild When I'm desperate and black You are gold I confess that since you loved me, I have everything. I confess that since you loved me, it's been easy. Yes, I know we've reached a stage. But your eyes don't seem to age 
You can light the darkest hour with your laughter. All the times I've been afraid, you bring me comfort unashamed. You're the only one who sees what I'm after. And you know that since you loved me, I have everything. Yeah, you know that since you loved me, it's been easy. I'm Steve Harley, and you're listening to me on Cattails. So no, you're, you're spot on with where you were going with that conversation, actually. Yeah, it's all ambivalent. You know, it, it, people, even way back, and when we released um, one of the, my early hits was Mr. Soft, and yeah. um, the, my then manager was asking me, the promotion man at EMI was asking me, and a third guy in the industry came to me and said, Who's that about? Is that about me? Who's that about? <laughs> <laughs> and I'd just say, look, it's about whoever you want it to be about. It's ambivalent. It's it's ambiguous. Um, I'm not telling you because I probably don't know. <laughs> yes. People ask these questions, and if you give them an answer, then they they, they take it as gospel. Yeah, of course. And six months, yeah, and six months later, I say something else, and then they write on Facebook saying, "That's not what you said last year." <laughs> you go, oh, come on, yeah, get out exactly. of here. <laughs> Who cares, you know, <laughs> just enjoy it if you can. Oh, absolutely. So, you, you know, you've just mentioned Mr. Soft, Soft there, and, of course, we've, we've talked about Make Me Smile. I mean, that's that's the sort of gift that keeps on giving, that particular song, isn't it? We're now on the Viagra adverts and oh. all this sort of stuff. At least they didn't choose Mr. Soft, that's all we can say. <laughs> but Yeah, yeah, thank you, you know, very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's lovely to think that um, your music comes to mind, even in that modern day when, you know, the, the people who were now creating adverts probably would not have been around in the time when you composed that. Yeah, um, yeah, so yes, yeah. they have got longevity. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's phenomenal. Um, yeah, Make Me Smile, it's got a life of its own. Uh, no, no question. Yeah, absolutely. Wish I'd heard of them. Well, yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly it, isn't it? <laughs> you know, you know, but, you know, you've got some absolutely wonderful gems in your whole of your archive there. I mean, have you got songs that you have actually, um, you know, written that you have not put on albums, deliberately not put on an album yet? Or, um, you know, have you got a little archive that's hidden away? A oh, well, stuff? I've got loads, loads, loads and loads. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you may. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. No, the one on the new album, on the Uncovered album, is a song called called Only You, mm. and uh, that was played live 20 years ago, um, but has never been recorded. Amazing. So uh, that's, that's, that's a, you know, I suddenly went, let's do that, and I get these two great gospel singers uh, with us on the record, and uh, it just suited them as well, yeah. Uh, no, I'm, I write all the time. I mean, there's dozens sitting here. I, I transferred... Um, from one iPhone to a new one, a different one, um, about a year ago. And onto the i, what's it called? Uh, iMusic or something on the computer? Yeah, yeah. Uh, something like that. There's an app on the PC that everything goes, it's synced up to. 
and it, it downloaded 80 new songs, 80. I mean, they're not finished. Right. They're stuff, they're things that I record late at night and, and uh, work a little bit on and then put them away again. Uh, and they come back out. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a struggle to, to, compl- to complete a new song these days. It's a bit of a struggle. Uh, as you get older, it doesn't get easier. Well, no, and I suppose it's a different environment that you're you're doing it in. It's it must feel a little bit more for pleasure and self fulfilment now, rather than necessity for a record album. Yeah, you know, a record company who's say, I need the next number one. Yeah, I I, uh, I envy those of my generation that can continue to uh, put out new tracks, new albums, new uh, full of new songs. Uh, there aren't many who do it. Um, there aren't many at all. Most of us are living on our back catalogue. Mm. Uh, nothing wrong with that. If you've got a hundred, hundred or two hundred songs recorded, that's a lot of light. And, and, and what we, what, what, what you do now is play live. Yeah, live yeah. music, touring, and not, not so much touring, but gigs, playing a lot of shows, which I do. That's the livelihood, and that's when I work. Fifteen people work. You know. Um, yeah. I like that idea, and I love being on stage. Uh, it's you don't wake up dreaming about being in the top ten anymore. Most of us don't. It's uh, it's a that's a young person's place to be, you know. Mm. And of course, the music industry's changed so much, hasn't it? So you know, in the the, the days where we're talking, you know, back in the seventies, eighties, or whatever, you you had a top ten, and a number one really was a big deal, wasn't it? Now oh you yeah, yeah, quite yeah. Got the same charts, have you? No, you can be number one for a day yeah. now. Yeah. A day, <laughs> <laughs> and, Sp- and Spotify is uh, iniquitous. It's, uh, it's it's just terrible for the artist. It's of no use at all. It, it, it's oh, no. purely for the the disposable the throwaway music lover of throwaway music. You know, it's yeah. it's uh, here today, gone tomorrow. And we we make nothing from it. It's all so wrong. Yes, I know. I know. I hear this, this so so much in the conversations that I have about the the, the day, modern day streaming, the way we consume music these days is is really not a good place for the artist, is it? You know, because there's no, bit, no, 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 no way of making anything from it to to com, you know compensate you for your time. So live dates so is really what it's about, isn't it? It's about gigging because that's yeah. If you can't, I, I, I've done a few um, master classes. Uh, um, and I say to these young people that are at music colleges where I've done them, you don't depend, if you're going to be a musician, don't depend on sales to live on. You know, it, you've got to be able to play live, practice your instru- instrument, listen to the best, emulate the best, and learn a little bit of stage presence, learn to be different, special. Because that's where you're going to, that's what you need to do. If you want a career, you've got to be able to play live and and have people come back to you, want to see you play. You've got to give them something special. If if you're rubbish live, you know, you get no dates, no gigs, you've got no income. You won't be a professional musician. Yeah, simple as that. Hmm. Yeah, you can't be Mike, Mike, what was his name? Tubular Bells? Oh, yeah, Mike Oldfield. Mike Oldfield, uh, yeah. you know, you, you know, you can sell twenty million albums and never play live. Yeah. You could then. Yeah. You're not going to, you're not going to do that anymore. No, absolutely not. So, how do you prepare then for doing all these live dates? Because you, you do actually have quite a few dates booked in for this year, which is wonderful. After we've had this lockdown business, finally oh, yeah, no, getting out a, there, it's great. Yeah, we've it? got about fifty already on sale this year. Amazing. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, the, we lost sixty shows uh, mm. the first when the first lockdown came last year, the year before last. Um, but they all got rescheduled mm. uh, with some difficulty, but the promoters were great. You know, they worked their backsides off and found availabilities that everyone else was looking for, you know. Yeah, yeah. Everyone was battling for the they same were, yes. same, the same the venue on the same Friday night, you yeah, know. <laughs> I can imagine <laughs> a bit of a bun fight there trying to get it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but how do you keep yourself fit for that? You must actually, you know, have to prepare yourself physically as well as mentally because that's quite a big, yeah, marathon, really. Well, I'm, I, I'm just a low carbs man. I don't eat rice and potato and stuff, and uh, okay, um, I don't, that just keeps the weight down. I like that because I, I don't get a lot of actual physical exercise. Mm. But 
no, no. Luckily, I, I'm, I'm quite, I don't, I, I don't put weight on, and uh, to, to be ready to sing, I sing all the time. I mean, yeah. I sing, at, yeah, I sing at home. I yeah. sing playing the guitar all the time. Yeah. Uh, so that's what it is, and, and vocal, vocal warm ups. But I don't do anything especially bonkers, you know. No, of course. Well, just want to get out there into that spotlight and play. And you know? do it and do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, all the dates there are on your website, steveharley.com. Let's point everybody there to go and book a ticket because when I saw you last, it was an amazing show. And I think you'll, I'm, I'm no doubt you're going to be doing some of the uncovered material as well, I'm assuming. Yeah, I've, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got a lot of acoustic band dates on sale. That's a four-piece acoustic band. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of shows like later in the year we're touring as the full Cockney Rebel rock band. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I wear two hats. Sometimes. There's something there for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so what's left for you then, Steve? You know, what what is it you would love to do in your life before you, you uh, leave this mortal coil? <laughs> Oh no, I, I'm, I'm not an ambitious person. I, I more of the same will do for me. Um, at the moment, I've got three wonderful, fabulous grandchildren, aged between six and one, uh, and I, I yeah, I'd like to help set them up because life's harder for young people now than it was for us. We 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 could get on the housing ladder easily, the property ladder, and whatever it's called. <sighs> You know, it's t- tough for them now. It's all so so different, and it's uh, it's only right that if you can, they should come to the bank of mum and dad. I mean, I'm I'm not leaving everything until I shuffle off this mortal coil. That's not right. <laughs> I'm sharing what I've got with my kids these days. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, well I can watch them enjoy it. Yes, exactly. Absolutely, and that's what it's about, isn't it? And I think as you get older, you look at life and you think, Do you know, it's all about this day, isn't it? This moment in time. Yeah, I've read one or two slebs coming up with this this stuff about I'm not leaving my money to my children. Why, why not, you miser? Why not? <laughs> Where else do you want why, to why, leave it? Why are you saying? Why are you saying that? Yeah, yeah. You know, I want them to work for it themselves. Why? Yeah. What's wrong with sharing it with your loved ones for Pete's sakes? Exactly. It's just being it's being woke. It's saying what they think the public wants to hear, but it's rubbish. You know, share it. Make life easy for people you love. Oh, yeah. If you can. Well, if you can, why not? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make sense, does it? That, you know, there's people there you love and you can help them and you don't. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard it from that. What's that angry chef, the one who swears all the time? Uh, uh, Gordon Ramsay. Ramsay said it. Then James Bond came out with it last year. <sighs> uh, Daniel, someone, the actor. Daniel Craig. Craig. He came out with it. Did you it? know. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not leaving it to my children. It's going to charity and blah blah blah. Why? <laughs> that's you just give, crazy. give to chat. Give to charity, old man. That's yeah. that's fantastic. <laughs> Do that, but keep quiet about it. That's what charity is. You don't brag about it. Yes. But what's wrong with sharing it with your loved ones? Make their lives better. Yes, yeah, I can't so think right. of a better reason to be alive than sharing what you've got. Yeah, absolutely. So they. You know they don't they don't impress me at all those people. I don't know if they mean it if they're saying it because they think it's what the public wants to hear. Yeah, I don't know, and I don't know whether it's endearing it endearing them to anybody anyway. And if they it is, it's people who are not like minded in the first place. They don't worry about them, you know. No, As you say, yeah, this woke society, it's you know, it's crazy, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's uh, it's starting to. Start a, yeah, well, yes, you must bring, <laughs> yes. you don't want to bring up subjects like the Markles with me and my wife. <laughs> uh, you know, no. we're, we're not big fans. No, no, it's funny, isn't it, how, you know, just uh, a few things that somebody can do, you know, we should be talking about PR and marketing and stuff with somebody in your in your band upsetting anybody. But, you know, you look from the outside and you think, yeah, do you know, you've made a mistake there, really yeah. have, Harry, what are you doing, what are you you're thinking <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, you know? yeah cancel cancelling people from oh, because of their history 400 years ago it's like what do you oh, what does it matter i know and this is it yeah. you know you can't rewrite history as soon as you no, start no, no. doing that it's mad isn't it no yeah there's a big problem with the bigots of you know you don't agree with me therefore you're wrong yes uh, excuse me whatever happened to a bit of debate absolutely we seem to have lost that though don't we i mean i think people well, are they're also self-righteous yeah, yeah I, 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 I'm 
you don't want to, uh, let's not get into that. <laughs> I'll, I'll, <laughs> that's for that's for sitting over a <laughs> over a bar with a glass of wine, isn't it? And saying, yeah, and another yeah, yeah. thing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear. Oh, do you know, it's been an absolute delight, Steve. I, I could talk to you all day. I really could. And we could go into all sorts of subjects. But I know you've probably got so much left to do with your time than speak to me. So. Uh, no, it's fine. I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Oh, bless you. You're so lovely. Oh, no. Real pleasure. I wish you well with it. OK. No, it's been a real pleasure. All right. Any time. listening to Cat Tales with me, Cat, and my guest today, Steve Harley. The tracks featured are Make Me Smile, Come Up and See Me, from live album Anytime, Only You, and Compared With You, Your Eyes Don't Seem to Age from Uncovered, and Seeking a Love from the Face to Face album. Visit steveharley.com for more information about Steve, where to purchase his music, and when and where Steve and the Cockney Rebels will be performing live. To listen to this again, and to other tales, Visit cattails.co.uk. You've been listening to Cattails.